All right, good evening. Let me invite you to come on in and we'll begin our evening gathering here together. Grateful to see each of you back for this evening, the opportunity to gather around the Lord's table, one with another, in obedience to him. Uh, just a reminder that tonight is a Lord's Supper service. That's the whole purpose of this. And so we will uh, just look forward to, in multiple facets to this evening, recollecting uh, what it is that Christ has done for us. Also, we examine ourselves to make sure that we are right before the Lord and that we are handling this gift that he's given to us appropriately. Uh, we get to participate in this as the Lord has called us to do this action together. And then beyond that, it is a unique opportunity that in what we do, we proclaim the gospel. And so let us remember all those aspects as we begin here tonight. But we are thankful for that. And then we get to celebrate just being together this evening because of the Lord Jesus. And so we'll have a time of fellowship down in the gym and there will be dinner down there. And then we'll be able to have time to play both in the gym as well as out on the soccer field and the playground. I'm told there might even be a basketball game going on in the teen room there if you want to watch that. And um, just opportunities to be together here this evening. Also, let me remind you that the Young at Heart will have lunch Tuesday at 1130. And so if you can be a part of that, let me encourage you to connect with Les and make sure that you get your name on that list there for seats on Tuesday at 1130. And then also youth group, don't forget Saturday from 11 to 3, you will have a scavenger hunt together. Let's go ahead and pray, and let's ask the Lord to bless as we come tonight in remembrance of his son. Let's pray. Our Father, we do, even as I just mentioned here moments ago, we come to this service, and we want to be actively involved. This is not a time for us to come and just passively let something happen around us. But Lord, we come tonight to remember the Lord Jesus, just as he commanded that we should. We, we come tonight to remember him. It is an ordinance that he has ordained that we would do this. And so we're here tonight to remember him. And we're going to do that through song. We're going to do that through the word. We're going to remember even as we hold elements and consider them and partake of them, that they represent the body of our Lord Jesus and the blood that was spilled in order that we might have redemption paid on our behalf. And we rejoice in that tonight. And so, Lord, we want to not take this evening lightly or flippantly. May we not even treat it casually, but Lord, may we come examining ourselves, making sure that we joyfully and seriously consider what it is that we are doing and what has been done for us. So tonight, Lord, in all that we do, both to ourselves and even to those who might be watching what we do, may we remember that we are proclaiming that we do this knowing that Christ is coming again for us. And we delight in that as we know that he delights in the coming day that we will gather with him to partake of the feast together. 
So Lord, may all this tonight, with looking backwards and looking forwards, cause our hearts to be grateful and thankful unto you for all that you've done for us. So bless our gathering with your help, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing some songs that will help us with that. We're going to start with the vicarious atonement that Christ was our substitute. And as we sing, look for all the places that sinless Christ switches places with we sinners in the crucifixion. Let's sing, His Robes for Mine. discussion groups today, we discussed how the cross not only provides forgiveness from sin, but also should help us stay away from sin and abandon sin in our lives. Look for that as we sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.
Sorrow and love flow go down. Did there such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich? seated. For our evening meditation during this Lord's Supper service, let me invite you to go back to 2 Samuel 24. And the reason I'd like you to turn back to 2 Samuel 24 this evening is I want to stress the point that the necessity of atonement is seen from cover to cover in the scriptures. The necessity of atonement is seen in Old Testament and New Testament alike. And for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, I think we'll see it very clearly even as we punctuate what we were speaking on this morning. I want to begin in verses 15 and 16. So let me pray and then we'll look to those together. Father, we as your people understand the necessity of atonement. You really have spoken to it. The fact that we eat of the bread and drink of the cup reminds us of it. But even as we look to a passage we studied this morning and we see from perhaps just a slightly different angle these similar or same truths, would you encourage our hearts that the scripture is not simply an amalgamation of lots of different stories that have different points, but that while there's morality to be learned, truths to be held on to, ultimately this is a book that reveals your glory through your son and the plan of redemption that you have one with another from before the foundation of the world. And thank you that in the fullness of time you sent your son, born into this world, born of a virgin, that he might live under the law and redeem us from the burden of it. He might pay the sacrifice of sin for his people. We praise you for this, and we ask you for us to not only see it, but to see it worshipfully this evening. We ask it through Christ our Lord. Amen. Verse 15 with me. So the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning even to the time appointed, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, it is enough, stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Aruna the Jebusite. So if you remember, David has sinned He's done so willfully by numbering the people. This was against the very desire of God. Because he's done this, he has, through the prophet Gad, been given one of three options as a means of judgment or consequence for his actions. He chooses option three, and so the Lord, in verse 15, sends a pestilence. He pours out his wrath justly. But remember in verse 14 when David says, I want to fall into the hands of the Lord and not into the hands of men because I know the mercy of the Lord is great. We know that David's trust is well proven because in verse 16, when the angel gets to Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord speaks up and says, that's enough. Stop right there. 
Even in judgment, God displays mercy. The angel stops at the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. If the building now in verses 18 and 19 of an altar is commanded from God, then we have a very important lesson to learn. Because though the angel of the Lord has been stayed, though the Lord has said, that's enough, stop right there, if he goes on and he commands that an altar be erected and that sacrifices be made, what that means is this matter isn't done. Yes, the angel has been providentially stopped by the word of the Lord, but it could just as quickly pick back up again. There needs to be some sacrifice made, some atonement made. Let me show you what I mean. Look again at verse 18. God came that day to David and said unto him, Go up, rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. And David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. So the prophet comes, excuse me, the Lord goes to the prophet and says, tell David to build an altar on that threshing floor. Gad goes to David and says exactly that. And so David heads up to Aruna's place and to find the threshing floor as the Lord commanded. Why? Why stress this point? Because though the Lord has providentially and for a moment's time stayed the angel's hand, there is no confidence as of yet that this is a permanent stopping of what the angel is going to do. There is no guarantee that the angel's work is done for good. It may be that he has stopped him, but that he will tell him to start right back up. And so David heads up to the threshing floor to make the altar. Remember, Aruna notices the king's procession and goes to meet him. Long story short, he says, whatever is mine is yours. Take the threshing floor, take my oxen, take the weaponry, it's yours. Please may the Lord receive your sacrifice. But verse 25 is crucial, Christian. Notice what it is that scripture says. David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. Okay? The angel comes to Jerusalem. He's about to pour out further wrath in this time of pestilence. The Lord speaks up and says, that's enough. Hold your hand right there. Prophet, go tell David, build me an altar and make some sacrifices. To that point, what we have read is exactly what God commanded. Now what does God do? The end of verse 25. So the Lord was entreated for the land, and after that's happened, the plague was stayed from Israel. What was necessary before the plague was actually stopped, before it was finally done. It wasn't merely in verse 16 when the Lord said to the angel, hold your hand, that's enough, don't go further. That's like hitting the pause button on the movie. We're not sure if we're gonna hit play, we're not sure if we're turning off, we don't know what's gonna happen next, we just know it's paused. And at this point in verse 16, the wrath of God has been momentarily paused. But the prophet says to David, the Lord has yet more requirement of you. Go build the altar and make sacrifice. David does. And once atonement is made, listen very carefully. The wrath of God is satisfied. But God's wrath was not fully satisfied until payment was offered, until atonement was made. Now this was temporary because of the pestilence for three days amongst David and the people of Israel. But what is the means God provides for his wrath to be removed completely? How is it that God's wrath can be removed eternally? What's the answer to divine wrath and human guilt? Divine wrath cannot be fully and finally paid by the offering of animals. We know that because of what we just read in 2 Samuel 24, but we also know that because Hebrews 10 says, in beginning in verse 5, wherefore when he comes into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. 
And every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. Then what can? What fully pays for or atones for the wrath of God? Verse 12 of chapter 10 says, This man, after he offered one sacrifice for sins, sat down on the right hand of God forever. Divine wrath can only fully and finally be paid for through the penal, that is penalty, substitutionary, that is one taking the place of another, sacrificial, that is him dying on behalf, the penal, substitutionary, sacrificial atonement of Jesus Christ. And why is Jesus Christ in particular necessary as the atoning sacrifice? For a couple of reasons. First, because as the God-man, only Jesus in his perfection was able to earn our righteousness. Only Jesus perfectly obeyed the law of God. Galatians tells us it is Jesus who fulfilled all righteousness. And since he fulfilled all those lawful requirements, those who put their faith in Christ received the benefits of Christ's righteousness. Why is it that only Jesus is able to make full and final atonement for the sins of his people? Because Jesus Christ is the only one capable of paying the penalty for our sins through his suffering and death on the cross. And there are several ways in which Jesus suffered and died for believers. The scripture tells us in Isaiah 53 and verse 3 that Christ suffered as a man of sorrows throughout his life. You get that mental picture, that your Savior endured a life of hardship. Is it any wonder why Hebrews would tell us he is well acquainted with our afflictions? He knows our griefs. We don't have a high priest sitting in the heavens who's aloof and unknowledgeable about what you're going through. He himself is a man of sorrows. Mark 15 and verse 24 says they crucified Christ, the suffering the horrendous death of a Roman crucifixion. He suffered this death. He also suffered in bearing the sins of his people. For Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But perhaps one of the most sobering thoughts is that Christ suffered by being abandoned by the Father. Matthew 27 and verse 46, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you abandoned, why have you abandoned? forsaken me. Oh, Jesus indeed suffered. But even as we speak this evening, Jesus suffered by bearing the fullness of the wrath of God on the cross in the place of sinners. In Romans 3 and verse 25, Paul tells us that Jesus was the one whom God put forward That is, Jesus is the one whom God hand-selected. He's the one who he pushed to the front of the line, as it were, as the propitiation for sin by his blood. What is propitiation? That which appeases the wrath of God. So what am I saying? I'm saying that in 2 Samuel chapter 24, animals had to die as the temporary substitutionary payment for sin so that God's wrath would be appeased, so it would be stopped or stayed. The pestilence would be ended. If there hadn't been the altar erected and the animals sacrificed, the peace offerings given, the pestilence wouldn't have ended. That's what verse 25 tells us. They were necessary, but they only serve as a foreshadow of the greater payment. What payment? The necessary sacrifice of Christ that purchases everlasting life for all who believe in him. That through his perfect life and sacrificial death, Jesus appeases the wrath of the Father so that all who come to him by faith might know what it is to enter into the joy of the Lord both now and forevermore. That's why we gather tonight. That's why we take of the cup. That's why we eat of the bread and we remember the sacrifice, the penal substitutionary work of Jesus. This is not mere sacramentalism. This isn't us just simply remembering for the sake of remembrance. This is us as the people of God worshiping the triune God. 
This is us as the people of God rejoicing in the sacrifice of God. This is us as the people of God fully dependent upon the grace and mercy of God. This is why we as God's people sing what riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We, like David and the people of Israel in the Old Testament, stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And that mercy is fully and finally given because of the sacrifice of Christ. Let's pray together. Father, I fear that in the day-to-day events of our lives, we don't recognize the, the, central, the centrality, the necessary importance of the atonement. That if sacrifice is not made that appeases your wrath, we stand forever alienated from you. Without hope, without the possibility of reconciliation, redemption, adoption, forgiveness of sins, there's nothing for us to look forward to if there is no atonement. But because on that Christ, on that cross, Christ, the God-man, fulfilling all righteousness in the place of sinners, died substitutionarily and declared, it is finished. All who turn from sin and trust in him can know everlasting life. I pray for those who are here this evening and know nothing of this gospel. They do not know of the perfection of Jesus Christ, of his righteous life, and of his sacrificial death. These are mere words to them. I pray your spirit would give them life even as I'm speaking. Grant them faith to believe. Save them, we ask. Father, I pray for those of us who know we're Christians, not because of works of righteousness, which we have done, but because of your mercy in saving us. May we never tire of remembering the necessity of the atonement. May we never tire of reflecting upon the penal substitutionary work of Jesus. Just as these oxen were necessary in the Old Testament to appease your wrath and stop the pestilence, so your eternal wrath stored up must be paid for by the perfect sacrifice. And it has been through Jesus Christ the righteous. We thank you for this. We bless your name and we ask that as we marvel in light of such grace and mercy, our lives would reflect joyful obedience and submission. Our lives would reflect worship and delight in you more than the temporary trinkets of life. May the gospel be central, meaningful, even delightful to us, we ask, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and sing together our communion hymn.
pri privilege to be able to participate in the table together. Let me just remind us who it is that should be and who it is that should not be participating this evening. Here at Landmark Baptist, we say if you are not a Christian, then you should not be participating in this this evening. This is the Lord's table, and because it is, he sets forth requirements. This is for his church. And what that means is, if you are a Christian, if you're a member of a church in like faith and in good standing, whether it's this church or not, we would encourage you to participate tonight. But please don't participate if either you are not a Christian, or if you perhaps are, but you know in your heart you are not in good standing with this church or with another church. Don't have callous disregard for the sacrifice of Christ by participating tonight if you know you shouldn't. I don't want to discourage you, perhaps, from participating if you think you should. Some of you, perhaps, are wondering, should I participate if I've had a really disastrous month, if it's just been really badly, uh, if I've acted quite badly in mind, in word, in deed? We want to address this from time to time because I want to remind you, none of us bring perfection to the table. If that is what would be required, none of us could participate this evening. But it is a requirement that you are right with God and right with fellow man. And so if there is no sin in your life for which you are unrepentant, there's nothing you're harboring in your heart, you know that you've done wrong and you refuse to deal with it before the Lord or before someone else. If the testimony of your life is that you are clean before God, even though it's been a tough month, it's been a tough day, it's been a tough year, we would encourage you to appropriate afresh the work of Christ, enjoy his forgiveness, and eat and drink. We say this from time to time and we mean it. You can eat worthily tonight because you have a great savior, not because you've had a great week. And I hope you understand the difference between those things. But let me say briefly a word to our children and then I'll ask our men to come forward. In 1 Corinthians 11, the passage I always read when we take the Lord's table together, the Bible actually commands us, Jesus telling his church that we are to do this as a remembrance of him and that we're to do it from time to time. He says, as often as you do it, do it to remember me. God says we do what we're about to as a command that we're supposed to obey. If you're here tonight as a young boy or a young girl, I hope you understand the importance of obedience. This is actually something that will help you in the Christian life. If you're wondering, am I a Christian, am I not? Am I like my older brother or older sister who is a Christian? Or am I like my older brother or older sister who isn't a Christian yet? Who am I? Am I a follower of Jesus? The Bible says that those who actually love Jesus are the ones who keep his commandments, who do what he says. So how do you know if that's you? Do you like to do what God commands in his word? Do you like to follow him? Do you love what he loves? Do you hate what he hates? If so, that might be an encouragement you actually are one of God's people, that you're following him as a Christian. But none of us does that perfectly, even your mom and dad. They don't follow Jesus and all of his commands all the time. So what do we do when that happens? Do you want to hide your sin? Do you want to keep it and not let anybody aware of it? Or when you sin, does it grieve you and bother you and make your heart feel all kinds of horrible and you just have to confess it. You have to make it right with mom and dad, with your brother or sister, with your teacher, with your friend, with, your other, with another adult that you've done something with. If those things are true, those are probably good signs that you're a Christian, that you love the things God loves. But if you're in your heart being honest tonight and you sin, you go, I don't even care if I sin. I want you to know I'm praying for you because if there's not a desire for you to be made right with God, that probably means you're not a Christian yet. But we wanna talk with you about what it means. We wanna keep having conversations with you about how you can follow Jesus, how you can obey him. The reason you're not able to right now is the spirit of God's not in you. But when you become a Christian, God's spirit does come inside and helps you to want to do the things God wants you to do. So let me invite our men to come forward and you children, even as you're watching um, us participate tonight, Think on those things. Have conversations with mom and dad about those 
things. Just before we administer the elements of the table, I'm gonna ask, if you would, Dean, please pray for us. Bound prayer. Heavenly Father, we are sobered in what our sin caused your son, that he was bruised and broken for our transgressions, and he is, in fact, the bread of life. We are so thankful for your amazing grace that we are no longer considered enemies, but have been made righteous as part of your elect and will one day rule and reign as kings and priests. For this, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise that you rightly deserve. In Jesus' name, amen. As a pastor, you get to be, and you've heard me say this multiple times now, on the front row uh, in many of life's adventures, some of life's deepest sorrows and some of life's deepest joys. You get to be there with people in those moments. I don't know if you've ever thought about this perspective or not, but as one who's called by God to be an under-shepherd of this local congregation and you as God's sheep, there's a certain sweetness and joy standing up here and watching the elements being passed, watching you take the elements and know that you're about to eat and drink them. And in so doing, you are remembering Christ's sacrifice and publicly declaring, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. That's a real sweet pleasure. I look forward to doing it again with you this evening. I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. 
This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me, in remembrance of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This time it's become our practice, having ate of the bread and drank of the cup, to recite our church covenant with one with another. I hope you understand why we would do that this evening, why we do it so habitually. When we are united to Christ, we are actually united one to another. If you are in Christ and I am in Christ, we are family, and that requires certain obligations, commitments, covenant be made one with another. And so I'm gonna ask that our church covenant be placed upon the screen and us with joy to state this with one another as us unifying, not only are we in Christ, but we are also in union one with another. One with another, there it is. Let's begin. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God, to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another, as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and comfort, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrines, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, to the expense of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our actions. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy in feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense and always ready for reconciliation guided by Bible principles. We further engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible, right, with some other Baptist church where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of the word of God. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Remember, none of us do that with perfection, but we should be doing that with a trajectory upward. Even as we read that, there should be some, some measure of holy discomfort or discontentment. Every month we read it, we should be going, oh, I can do that better. By the grace of God and with the spirit in me, I can love better, I can serve better, I can maintain both family and secret devotions better. I can give of myself by means of my spiritual gifts, by means of my money, money, by means of my time. I can give of myself to this body. I pray that as you say the Lord's table, as we take of the Lord's table and we quote our covenant together, these are the thoughts that come to your mind. I'm gonna ask our deacons to come one more time and we're gonna take up our benevolence offering. This is the offering we take each Lord's Supper night as a way of caring for those amongst us who have needs from time to time. We're not exactly always sure what need will arise, but when it does, the Lord has always been very kind in my tenure, I'm sure before me, these 45 years at Landmark, that we've been able to care for and take care of the needs of this congregation. I know many of you looking out have been the beneficiaries of that from time to time. Some of us think perhaps we never will be, but only Lord knows the providence of our lives in the days ahead, and so we prepare looking after and caring for one another in this way through the preventative care of giving in this benevolence offering. Let me pray for it, and then we'll participate together in the giving. Father, meet the needs of this congregation. Provide for these brothers and sisters. Make sure that they are well taken care of. You promise that the righteous will not be forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. One of the ways that is ensured is through the church providing for one another. There's a sweetness to the New Testament model early on when the persecuted Christians had all things in common. 
were sharing all of the, the things they had so that one can live and another one can live nearby. I pray that that spirit would exist in all of us, that we would not only seek the welfare of our immediate blood family, but that we'd care for the family to which we've covenanted and even recited such a covenant this evening. Grant us not only the willingness, but also the commitment to follow through. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Again, we'll sing the last verse to our communion hymn as we proclaim Christ on earth and look forward to the day when we spend eternity with him in heaven. Just before we're dismissed, I know there were a ton of teen girls, I think there was eight or nine of them, who worked this afternoon to prepare the missions house and worked so well and gave of themselves so servant-mindedly, and they told me not to mention it this evening, and so I am going to take a moment and mention and how grateful I am for the ways that you gave of yourself so that that house would look nice for Joe and Sierra this evening, who are our missionaries and who we are glad to have back with us for an extended time just before we're dismissed for fellowship and for food and looking forward to a wonderful night together. I love how Jude finishes his letter. I love the benediction he offers. I think it's perfect for a night like this evening. In verse 24, he says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with, with exceeding joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen and amen.
We love you. You're dismissed.